I'd like to welcome everyone back um, for the final afternoon session. Um, our final roundtable today is on, on, is on the important topic of gender and leadership, equity in peace building. Our panelists are Peter Adieye, Amanda Luce, and Caitlin McMillan, with our Duke faculty director, Catherine Adme, moderating. Again, their bios can be found on our conference webpage and in the conference program. For those of you who are just joining us, um, I'll briefly outline how the roundtables work. The first half of each roundtable is devoted to discussion between our panelists, and the second half will give the fellows the opportunity to respond to you, the audience's questions. Some of these questions have already been submitted by email. If you have a question this afternoon, please submit it in the question and answer box. Um, we unfortunately that won't have time to answer all of your questions, but we'll do our best. And to remind you that today's conference is closed captioned and you can turn this on by clicking on the CC icon. Let's get started. Well, I guess the first thing we have to do is turn on, turn on our voices and our cameras. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to the last roundtable of our 18th annual, but first ever virtual Rotary Peace Conference, Peace and Resilience, Building Together a Post-COVID-19 World. It is my pleasure this afternoon to welcome our roundtable fellows, co-thinkers and fellow travelers in building a better world, Peter Adeyeye from Nigeria, Amanda Lutz from Brazil, and Caitlin McMillan from Canada. My name is Catherine Adme, and while I'm a national of the United States, I am first and foremost in my heart and mind an English-speaking South African, together with my very thoughtful and wise colleague at UNC, Suzanne Mamo, we serve as co-faculty directors for our Duke UNC Rotary World Peace Center. I'm on the faculty at the Stanford School of Public Policy at Duke and at the Duke Center of International Development, and I am lucky to be an affiliate faculty member at Duke's Global Health Institute. Before beginning this integrative roundtable, whose topic is gender and leadership, equity and peace building, I heartily encourage everyone to go to our conference website and bookmark the individual presentations that represent, if you will, the three legs of our table. I know from my earliest days of connecting to this beautiful Rotary family, when I was the president of my high school's um, Interact Club, the Irvine Newport Beach, California Interact Club, uh, the Rotarians are people who lunch and learn, always learning, especially over lunch. So these are recordings to watch and learn a lot over lunch. I'm gonna say a few words about each of these presentations before we begin. Amanda lays out a gender responsive framework for supporting women leaders. She explains how women in this time of great need for innovation and creativity on the part of our leaders everywhere are finding ways not to be ignored, excluded or left behind. She asks, what are the conditions in which collaborative and equitable leadership across gender identity will arise? Her gender responsive framework and the work she is doing to implement it concretely at the granular level provide us with truly inspiring answers. Peter connects strongly with this theme of rising, who rises, how we rise. In his case study from Nigeria, as a man in a country where women literally are pelted with tomatoes and jeers for marching on the streets to reject sexual assault and harassment, he intentionally, as one of my boldest former women students from Nigeria puts it, flips the script, or one might say, changes the narrative. His civil society organization, which he co-founded before he ever came to Duke, is devoted to raising in two senses, and two key senses, women leaders. First, to ensure these women leaders are nurtured and supported to come into their own. Second, to work so that their work is raised to a public level, is made visible. 
our global community at the most local and at the most global level will thrive, Peter believes, when women rise and rise up. Kate's presentation on women, peace and security is based on a report she co-authored for Oxfam International entitled, Do Our Voices Matter? It was published in December, 2020. You can find it online. It's worth reading in full. She tells the story of how women go before the UN Security Council to help this body deliberate more effectively and be more responsive and yet are too little heard. As the Nigerian novelist Ben Okri puts it, it is one thing to be given a chance to speak and another for our words to be heard. Mm -hmm. We know whether we are heard by what happens next, who respectfully comes alongside us, who brings their power and resolve to build together the meaningful inclusive peace that makes for positive peace. Rotarians are known for coming alongside and for building together. And in this hour, as in the two we had this morning, we will hear how our Peace Fellows first understand the world as it is, second, work to imagine it as it could be, and third, gather steam towards enacting and embodying in their own work these visions. Turning to the topic of gender and leadership, equity and peace building, I'd like to begin with each of our Fellows having a chance to do that first level of laying out recapitulating briefly their main analyses. So I'm going to turn first to Caitlin. Can you provide us with your sense of the key ideas from your presentation that you'd like our audience to retain, Kate? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Adme, for those lovely introductions to the topic and to ourselves. And it's just wonderful to be here with the Rotary community today. I'm just going to share a slide very briefly, um, and then I will take it down because I know that it always makes our faces a bit smaller. I want you be, to be able to see us. So um, my presentation is based on interviews with women human rights leaders from Yemen, South Sudan, and Afghanistan. And as Adme mentioned, I conducted these interviews as part of my applied field experience uh, with Oxfam International and the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace and Security this summer and supported by the Rotary Fellowship. And this work really emerged from a longstanding problem that women are today still vastly underrepresented and undervalued in the majority of formal peace processes and many high level decision making spaces to the ultimate detriment of peace building efforts. And as I say in my work, peace building that fails to include the views of women and other marginalized groups and account for their experiences, rights and interests is doomed to fail and even set the stage for future conflicts because it is predicated on inequality. So let me stop sharing now and then continue. So from a human rights perspective, we know women have a right to be involved in the decisions that affect their future. And we also know that peace agreements are more likely to be durable if women and other civil society groups are involved throughout the process. Yet, despite this evidence, women's exclusion in formal peacemaking spaces persists. So the women I spoke with are really raising the alarm. They do an incredible amount of peace building in their communities, and they're going to the highest levels, like the UN Security Council, to say, hey, these are the conditions for people, and this is what we could be doing to stop conflict. But then their points aren't being taken on board, and state actors aren't being held accountable to their voices, experiences, and expertise. So we're calling for more meaningful uh, listening and participation, and that's what I'm trying to highlight in my work. And in my presentation, I share some of women's specific calls to actions uh, that they shared with me, including partnering with networks of human rights defenders like the Women's Solidarity Network, Solidarity Network, which was co-founded by two Yemeni women, um, and to help amplify their, acts, their um, actions and expertise by also directly resourcing women-led civil society organizations in conflicts, 
in, in conflict set, settings which are chronically underfunded, such as Matwana in Yemen, Women in Peace in Afghanistan, and the Center for Inclusive Governance, Peace and Justice in South Sudan, which are all organizations the women I spoke to are involved with, among many others. And these, I think, are critical actions that important international actors like Rotary could be leading on that would make a real difference to the possibility of peace and the lives of women and girls around the world. Uh, thank you, Kate. I wonder if we could move now to you, Amanda. Your, your presentation was entitled Together and Individually, Gender Responsive Support for Women Leaders. Can you say more about this? Of course. Um, hello, everyone. It is a great honor to be here today to share the current focus of my work with you all and in the company of Kate McMillan, Peter Adaye, and Catherine Anime. I am a journalist from Brazil who worked for many years telling stories for women and about women and gender issues. And today as a Peace Fellow, I, I'm studying educational innovation and technology at the UNC because I want more, more women to lead their own stories and to lead their community's stories. And I have been researching tools and the strategies that can make that happen. Uh, for those who didn't have the chance to watch my presentation before this panel, I presented um, my research based on the on a simple question, as Ed may uh, explain in our introduction, how truly effective um, training for women leaders should look like. Uh, throughout my studies and also my applied field experience with Vital Voices Global Partnership last year, I mapped uh, the main strategies that can support um, women towards um, leadership positions. I think I should also um, share my screen and then share uh, this model that we are going to talk a bit today. Um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, you can see this model, sorry, <laughs> I couldn't see. So these strategies, they are not skill based for women to look, sound and lead um, like um, how we understand leadership today. Um, because leadership, as we understand it um, today, it is based on a long history of behaviors um, and values also of how a man would um, look, sound, and lead. So even when some individual women, they achieve top positions, they find, they find out um, that they are foreign to that environment. And very often they have to fend for themselves in what can be a very hostile environment. So instead, um, support for women leaders should combine strategies for them to succeed individually, but also as a group. Um, in this gender responsive model, um, I show some of those strategies that are storytelling, mentorship, network groups, and paying forward to future generations, for example. So the main point is that I propose that we all should support women to lead differently and build peace differently because it is of our interest as societies. And I hope we can talk more about that today here. All right, Peter, can you help us understand more about your presentation uh, called Creating Platforms for Raising Women Leaders, Case Study from Nigeria? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's such a great pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Professor Adme and my amazing colleagues, Amanda Lees and Kathleen McMillan. I've learned a lot from you over the last two years. Yes, um, as my title indicates, the common message is simple. Uh, we all should be creating platforms for raising women leaders. If you have time to watch my presentation, I cited some great women leaders, such as um, Chimamandi Ngozi Adichie and Ngozi Okonje Ewiela. Um, for many of you, Chimamande, um, Chimamande Adichie is an award-winning novelist, and Ungozi Okonjo Ewela is the current director general of the World Trade Center. One thing that has made a difference in their life has been the role of mentorship and support. They both had parents that were academia who provided them with the mentorship and support they needed to be who they are today. And when I look at myself and the work that I do, I acknowledge the influence of my parents, my friends, my mentors over the years. And the question is this, what about the millions of girls in Nigeria who don't have this kind of privilege and opportunity that I have? So I'm gonna talk about the three um, takeaways. And I'll, I'll also share my screen just like my colleagues did. And so first, as um, Arundhati Roy, an Indian writer said, he says sometimes, 
there is troops in hold cliches. Cliches. There can be no real peace without justice. So raising women leaders is about social justice. We can only have positive peace when we tackle the root causes of gender inequality and we create platforms to raise women leaders. Secondly, women leaders are powerful in conventional and unconventional ways. While women like Ngozi Okonje Wiela with so much power and influence nationally and internationally, a woman like Olate Joaquin who I shared a, who shared a story in my presentation, shows another dimension of power. It's called soft power. They are resilient, they are unstoppable, and they are great influencers. The last point, when we raise more, when we raise more women leaders, they will influence policies that will pull others women up. And together with all of us, we can, as allies, we can create a just and equitable world for everyone. Thanks, Peter. And thanks to all of you for opening in, in this good and strong way, leading. Um, let's turn now to the question that I think Amanda's presentation put squarely on the table and that all of you, all of you have spoken to. All of you highlight the need to work differently, to quote um, uh, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about the pathways that you have found to challenge inequitable structures. So I'd like to ask Amanda if you would begin. Yes, uh, thank you for this question and thank you for bringing um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's uh, quotes. I, I highlight in my presentation this beautiful quote by um, former president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. In that quote, Sirleaf says how the COVID-19 pandemic has shaken us collectively, uh, but women at all levels have come together to say that this shaking should be used to build a better and fairer world. And I like this quote a lot because it, is spotlight, it spotlights at least three aspects of how we can work differently with a gender responsive model. So first, it highlights the idea that gender equity is good for the whole society. And it's not just the work of women and girls. Change happens when in societies around the world, the women and men in their millions say, let's fix this, let's inform and equip each other to say, let's fix this. Um, second, I like this quote because um, it highlights uh, that women can play a critical leadership role in building more innovative and equitable solutions in society. And with the COVID-19 example, at the beginning of the pandemic, researchers were investigating why the few countries that are led by women were having better outcomes, for example. Um, third, and the core of my investigation is that gender responsive support for women leaders is different from regular target training for individual women. Training for women to run for office, for example, is important, uh, but usually they do not address the challenges that women face later when they become leaders in a context that is embedded with barriers such as gender biases. So this gender responsive support um, should address specific challenges that women in disadvantage and disadvantaged minorities face on the way to effect effectively lead for the whole community. It happens through work on one's own experience and in relation to others in a process um, to gradually build new stories of how leadership can look like. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Peter, turning to you, how, how would you go about answering this question of the pathways you have, you have built really to challenge inequitable structures? Thank you so much, Professor Adme. Um, I think to work differently is to think outside the box, to do things differently to get better results. So one of the approaches um, we use in my organization, Bandless Science Africa, the organization I co-founded, is to explore the use of storytelling to raise women leaders. So we explore storytelling through what I call the vertical and the horizontal dimensions. So let me explain this. As you, may, as you might have seen from my video, we started the Women in Leadership Conference series where we invite young women aged 15 to 40 years to learn from successful women from different sectors. The successful women we bring from different sectors, they share their stories to inspire the younger generation of women. That is what I call the vertical, it's coming from hope. Also among the young women, we ask them to share their stories of resilience and we provide them with incentives, such as giving them a small grant to expand their business. In that way, you see younger women inspiring each other. So that's like an horizontal way. Um, of 
of influencing each other. So that's like the vertical and horizontal um, way of doing things differently. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Our chance, our before we actually um, move to the second part of this hour, where we, I, I just like to call out now for those who are in our audience, please do um, add your questions so you can be part of our co-thinking here to the uh, to the Q and A, and uh, we'll be we'll be trying to answer as many of those questions as we can. But one of the questions that we thought about in advance that we thought okay. would be, I might also jump in just with a. Uh, something to say on that question too, if it's okay. Sure. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry, Amanda. <laughs> no, no, okay. it's okay. It is hard work hosting. So yeah, thank you so <laughs> no much for breaking in. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. Um, I, I just love the question, so I wouldn't want to miss the opportunity. And I think that there are kind of three key points I'd want to make in relation to the question. So one is around representation. I think we need to be attentive to whether women are present in formal peace building processes. And we could think of this as kind of having a seat at the table. Um, today, peace processes often perversely incentivize violence by saying, the more violence you commit, the more likely you will be given a seat at the table, while simultaneously overlooking and excluding women who do a huge amount of the peace building work at all levels. So that's representation. The second point, I think, is around changing the culture and changing the culture of formal peace building spaces. Frequently in my interviews, women told me about common experiences of harassment and dismissal um, or mocking their views if they if they do manage to get a seat at that table. So if we continue with the table metaphor, I think this tells us we need to be setting the table differently to ensure meaningful inclusion of different voices and experiences as possible. And then the final point I'd make is just around accountability. And um, this is really about asking, how are we listening to women's different perspectives and expertise, which I think are things Amanda and Peter have been picking up. And, and how do these form part of the final outcomes? If they're not being integrated, which we know is not happening consistently enough, then strengthening accountability mechanisms is essential. So representation, culture change, and accountability. Well, boy, am I grateful that we're all in this together. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> no problem. I, you know, there's something about wanting to just keep moving forward, gathering steam, but I yeah. never would want to do this at the cost of, of, of what you had to say there. So thank you so much. There was a moment where I was like, why is Kate breaking in? But thank goodness you were. All right. <laughs> so on that, on that note, let's turn to the one uh, question that we have already co-thought together, but have a chance to, to bring our whole audience with us, which is to, to really talk more about storytelling. In every panel this morning, somehow or another, the word story came up. And then many of your um, precedes right then, the word story came up. So I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more now, each of you, um, what, what storytelling is and how, how does it matter to equity and peace building? So Peter, I'll begin with you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, stories uh, are one of the most powerful means to influence, to teach and to inspire. I love stories. I've benefited a lot from my mom's story, from a teacher's story, and from you know personal story from my friends and colleagues. And so, one of the you know the power of stories is that one stories evoke curiosity. It it captures people's attention as they want to journey with the storyteller. Two story storytelling forges connection among people and between people and ideas. It can help convey the culture, the history, the values that unite people. Stories are also very easy to remember. They have this sticky effect that stays in our mind for years. I can still remember some of the stories my mom told me when I was five years old. The fourth part is the stories are inspirational and they can help generate positive emotions that can spur people to action. I'd like to ask us now, thanks for having started us out, Peter, if, if I can move now to the um, Amanda's answers to this this question. Yeah, uh, I completely agree with the examples Peter uh, provided. Storytelling 
uh, sometimes can be described as a, a powerful tool. And I actually said that as part of my uh, research. And it can, of course, be a tool for education, for advocacy, or for social change. Um, but if I may say, I think primarily stories are this fundamental part of our human consciousness. Stories are part of the way we think, uh, the way we feel, the way we remember, um, and the way uh, perhaps most important, more, most importantly, relate to others. So I think. I think it makes sense that um, in the previous panels, but also the three of us are talking about storytelling in this context um, of women and leadership, because we are imagining new pathways and building differently. Um, as part of the leadership development support, um, I say that storytelling could help us with at least three goals. First, it will support self-reflection and what is um, um, women leaders' sense of a larger purpose individually. Um, this can help them overcome later the challenges they face once they are in the political arena. Um, second, um, storytelling can help women leaders to share this sense of purpose and connect to others, creating this shared um, sense of purpose that other people will be uh, willing to commit to. This is important because to also overcome the challenges um, and to make their voices uh, make a difference, women need this group support. Um, and the, their community support too. And third, as Peter tells in his case study, um, I think storytelling is a great way for also to pay forward, inspiring other generations to come. Um, I, once I had this um, opportunity to listen to a Congress, Congresswoman tell us in a training session that she was very influenced by the former female president of Finland who asked herself, why not me? And this Congresswoman was inspired by this and asked herself, why not herself too? Uh, so even though uh, uh, that, that Congresswoman, she had a lack of support, she nominated herself for a leadership role in, con in the Congress of her country. And she was eventually elected and led on uh, laws against domestic violence. So that's, um, that's a really powerful story too. Yes, I agree with that. Thank you so much, Amanda, for retelling that story. So much of what's necessary in storytelling is, is the opportunity to amplify, have more people hear the story that was once heard. So thank you. Kate, could you, could you offer your thoughts on yeah. storytelling and how, how they work towards equity and peace building? Yeah, absolutely. It's so interesting, I think, listening to Amanda and Peter and the different way that stories work in peace building. And story came up a lot um, in it, and in important ways in my work with uh, human rights leaders. All of the women, for example, that I interviewed have shared testimony with the UN Security Council to raise attention to conditions and unfolding in their communities and call for immediate action and support. So this testimony to me is a type of storytelling. The information women share weaves together collective experiences. They carefully gather information from across civil society, gaining consensus and synthesizing the most uh, pressing concerns. Their testimony brings nuanced and unusual information that decision makers in the Security Council may not hear otherwise. And so testimony is a type of story that provides this critical evidence and it asks us to listen, to witness and act differently in relation to the story being told. When story, I think when story is shared as testimony, it asks us to consider our ethical, moral, as well as legal responsibilities to each other. But sadly, the compelling information, as I mentioned earlier, shared by women is often not fully listened to or acted upon by those in power. A final point I would make on story would be to presence the ways the women I spoke with do situate their opportunities to share testimony as part of a lineage of stories. And several of the women I spoke with saw their stories as opening a platform for others to come forward. And in this way, I think stories open space or they keep space for civic dialogue open. One woman from Yemen shared the sentiment with me saying, every time one of us goes up, we also take somebody else with us and try to give the stories of the others. Wow, such a lovely, lovely way of putting it. 
One of the things I really have appreciated about working with all of you is the way to which degree to which you're always mentioning each other, amplifying each other, amplifying other people who are amplifying each other. So uh, it's something that I think has to be done in our everyday life, mainstream, as we say, right? So this is an opportunity for us as a, as a trio in this round table for us to, to reveal to our audience the degree to which we have become friends, right? Where we've come to really be fellow travelers and to co-think what it is that we're going to do with our lives, which is, you know, the, the, the huge opportunity and the challenge we all face is how do we become peace builders? And part of how we become peace builders is because we attune to others and support others and gain inspiration from others. So I'd like to ask you now, um, in the few minutes we have before we start our second part, um, to co-think on point, as lawyers like to say, where you will choose one part of one of your fellows' presentations, just one element in that presentation, and say how it resonates with your own work. Uh, so in this way, you guys will be like a choir, attuning and harmonizing, and of course, amplifying each other. And, and to begin, Kate, could you offer us your resonances with Peter? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I was really struck by what Peter said today, but also in his presentation, his discussion of allyship and how the work of gender equality is everyone's responsibility, not just women's. This really comes from a place of recognizing that equity, as in the systems that work better universally, benefit us all. And Peter highlights the story of Senator Abiodun Olujimi, saying that in 2016, she raised the motion for the Gender Equality and Opportunity Bill which was a piece of legislation that would uh, domesticate the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women in Nigeria. But unfortunately, that bill didn't pass. And Peter wonders if that's because only 4% of uh, members of the National Assembly are women. And that really made me think, I'm wondering about how we shift these sorts of moves away from a niche women's issue to promote the understanding that we all win when human rights are promoted and fulfilled. Maintaining an unequal system hurts everyone and it breeds violence and other forms of harm. So Peter's work is so important, I think, for modeling how all of us can play a role in raising all boats. And I'd love to hear more from him on on allyship, either in our, our question period or in discussions later on. And I also, listening to Peter's work, um, I was reminded of the words of Maori activist and scholar um, Lila Watson, which we also looked at in our human rights and conflict class as Rotary Peace Fellows. She said, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come, if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And I think this is so relevant to the work that Peter's doing in a number of ways. But I also wanted to highlight this quote because Watson actually delivered that at the 1985 UN Decade for Women Conference in Nairobi. So there are so many kind of intersections with the work Peter's doing. It's so nice. It's such a lovely coincidence. Maybe not a <laughs> coincidence. Peter, may I ask you now to reflect a little bit on your colleague Amanda's work? Uh, thank you so much, um, Kathleen and Amanda. It's been great learning from uh, learning, studying with learning from you in and out of class over the last two years. So, Amanda, um, in one of your early slides, you re reiterated the need for for to, to rethink leadership. Um, as our problems become increasingly complex. And that is absolutely true. Um, as we speak, about 80 million people in the world have been forcefully displaced from their homes, the highest number we've ever recorded in history. You also cited COVID-19 and how countries with, with women leaders seems to be doing very well. In another class I'm taking this semester, I had the opportunity of studying New Zealand response to COVID-19. And as many of you may know, New Zealand is one of the countries making giant stride in its containment of the pandemic. As of today, they've only recorded 26 deaths. Their success can be attributed to strong political leadership, 
that relies on scientific guidance and the management of the pandemic. And guess what? Their Prime Minister, Jacinda Haddon, is a good example of what women leadership can mean when given the opportunity. I love the way you ask us to guess about things, Peter, especially because you speak with such authority with your, your answers. All right, so Amanda, would you bring up our, our, our rear on this and offer your reflections on Caitlin's work? Yes, um, thank you, Peter, for your reflection. Uh, Appreciate it. Uh, so in Kate's presentation, I also, um, I was moved by when she highlights this quote from Nazma from South Sudan that I think represents so beautifully, beautifully what we have been discussing here in this panel. Nazma said, and I read, um, we need not just to be consulted, but to be heard. When we raise concerns about tensions, mounting or the need for services, we speak from an informed position of local knowledge. These are our communities. Um, Kate says how these words um, illustrate so clearly why women's participation in um, official negotiating roles or through grassroots efforts is not just a right, but a necessity. And I think that even though the three of us have been talk talking about leadership in different contexts and levels, we all have been making the case for gender equity in leadership. And this quote uh, makes us all think about what equity really means. There is that metaphor that says that diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being invited to dance, and equity is being able to make decisions about the party, about the music, etc. So in the case of Nazma's quote in Kate's research, equity means that more than just having women in the room are being consulted. We need to create the conditions that these idea, ideas and knowledge uh, that they, they hold, um, um, that those women hold will be taken seriously and be incorporated uh, into peace agreements, into policies and into local government and so on. I really love that beautiful uh, epigraph on diversity, inclusion and equity. Thank you so much, Amanda, for sharing us that with us. Uh, well, now uh, we turn to the second half of our hour, so I'd like to pause for a moment and um, welcome questions from our audience. And uh, I see a lot of questions are coming in, uh, so let me begin uh, with one for Amanda. So here we go. If we take as a given that gender equality is an important issue to be addressed, and that there are many aspects of gender equality as well as other issues like climate and health that can be and should be prioritized in many countries today. Please explain your perspective on why women's leadership above all these other things should be a priority at this particular moment. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for um, this question. Um, this is in fact a great point for us to address um, because we live on a planet that is in peril from pandemics, climate change, as well as violent conflict and poverty. So why should gender equity be a priority, right? Or why having a one hour panel with Trippie's fellows proposing this in different and similar ways? Um, I, in fact, uh, of course, I applaud the drive to prioritize sustainability and um, development, for example, uh, but it would be a mistake to allow gender equity and women's leadership to fall down on the list of priorities because um, peace, shared uh, prosperity and gender equality um, and women's leadership, uh, they're not four different destinations. Each one is effectively a thread in this, let's say fabric of fair and sustainable societies. Uh, the UN, um, it makes the think of the UN that has adopted uh, 17 goals um, to guide activities on um, sustainable development, development until 2030. And gender equity was included for hard-headed, not feel good reasons. It is a response and um, it is a response for, to the evidence that shows that women uh, disproportionately um, and very often bear the burden of being denied education, healthcare, and economic um, economic opportunities, um, especially when there's a crisis like like now. So a dramatic change uh, can only be achieved through enabling women's access to health, econo economy, and political participation. But for that to help 
to happen, um, there's also evidence that women should be involved in making decisions. As Kate mentioned, to use her example again, <laughs> there is a positive impact on post-conflict stability when women are involved in peace agreements. Um, this is a great example of women leadership and knowledge being taken seriously for building more um, peaceful communities. So the main point is that most peace, the, the most prosper, prosperous and peaceful version of our communities cannot be reached without better including women in decision making. I really appreciate how you bring us to the close. The main point. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Otherwise, I could ramble here, but yeah, the main point. <laughs> You don't ramble, Amanda. <laughs> May I ask, I'm going to turn now to Kate, who you just uh, called out actually in your in your last comments there, Amanda. Um, one of your recommendations, Caitlin, uh, in this report that you wrote with Oxfam International and in, also in your um, in your in your presentation, which I commend everybody's to everybody's attention, is to um, end impunity for perpetrators of violence and address gender-based violence. Uh, so what exactly are the connections between violence, gender-based or otherwise, and women's participation in peace processes or lack thereof? That's a great question. Thank you for the audience for engaging with these um, kind of very thoughtful uh, points of, of our work. Um, it's a huge question as well. And so... Uh, what I might highlight is in my presentation, I share data from a recent study uh, from the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace and Security that found that 79% of armed conflict in situations for which there is data on conflict uh, happens in context with high levels of gender discrimination. So that link between gender discrimination or inequality and conflict starts to become really clear. We know that violence is a framework which inequality compels. So to maintain inequality, uh, whether on an intimate or a global scale, state or interpersonal violence become necessary. And so, and so often we know this also falls uh, disproportionately along gender and race and class lines to name but a few. So moving towards equity, it also means lessening the opportunities for violence to find a home and to be operationalized. So I, I see, um, somewhat to what Amanda was speaking about, these purposes as entangled. When we move towards equity, we reduce uh, the opportunities and the needs for violence um, to uh, be operationalized in our world. Yeah. Well, Peter, you have got a lot of questions, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna try to gather them together uh, because they do fall generally under this rubric of what does it mean to be an ally? And particularly, what does it mean for a man to be an ally? Um, and so the kind, these are the sort of types of lines of, of questioning you're getting. How do you experience and respond, Peter, to resistance in your work? Uh, do you think that uh, you increase the resistance um, from other gentlemen, as this lovely person put it, in uh, offering a different point of view? Uh, than your fellow men in Nigeria, the ones pelting people with tomatoes. What, what has it been like for you to get men to acknowledge the value of women in, our, in leading? And what do you think the dangers are for women when you do get men involved in this conversation? Thank you A so lot much. of questions. <laughs> It's fine. I'll I'll just thank you so much. Um, last semester, both uh, Amanda and Kathleen and myself we took a class with you uh, on human rights and conflict, and that's that's one of my uh, best class so far um, at Duke. And I remember one of my colleague uh, said something in class and said he said to speak for those that are downtrodden is a privilege, and I felt that quote it it is very powerful. So to be an ally is a privilege itself, and it means that we are using our privilege to raise minorities up. It means having the humility to listen to the perspective and the stories of those whose lives are shaped by structural inequality. It also means using our position, our power, our influence, our privilege 
to lift minorities up by being intentional in ensuring inclusiveness whenever we have the opportunity. Finally, it's, it's, it, it, to be an ally means to step out of your comfort zone. It means we are using our privilege again to change systems that perpetuate inequality. It means we are educating others that look like us to join us in our cause. And then we are using our privilege to influence policies that would disrupt, um, that would disrupt the system. So for instance, at Spanless and Africa, the organization I co-founded, I helped in designing a project called Men for Equality. We reach out to men in its informal networks um, and teach them about gender equality, about positive masculinity. So why men in informal networks? Well, in Nigeria, most men in informal networks, they, are, they have limited education and they are most times the custodians of patriarchal culture and norms and practices. For instance, I remember when we were engaging um, some men, I remember one man said that he feels justified to beat his wife as a way of correcting her. So, but, but interestingly, as we, start, as we strive to engage men, they begin to open up about their own insecurities, about their own vulnerabilities. And they started to see that gender equality helps everyone actually. Um, so that's, that's one of the ways you know, to do that. Yeah, can you tell us any stories, Peter, of, of, of men pushing back and of saying that you're wrong and how you've overcome that, that kind of pushback? I, 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 get, I, I, I get that a lot um, from, it's so interesting, like even some of my you know, colleagues um, say they, uh, you know, they don't see why I, so I get this question all the time, why are you advancing for gender equality itself? Uh, and I was, I, if you watch my presentation, I grew up in a family of four boys, but my mom raised us, you know, my parents raised us to, to love and, um, and lift others up. And I, I, I also recall a story my mom, you know, my auntie told me uh, while growing up that when my mom was in college, that she always prayed that all our children would be boys. And I, I wondered why, I asked her why. And she said, as a, young, as a young lady, she doesn't want any of her children to go through what women go through, most women go through um, in, in, in marriage in Africa. And I was taught and I'm moved by that. So a lot of the times I, I get, you know, questions, people asking, why do you have to do that? It's too idealistic, it's not possible. But I convince them and stick to my goals. Yes, that winning way is convincing, I can, I know. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask some questions that I think can be cast for our whole uh, round table here. Um, I'm, and in the way I'm amalgamating some of these questions, one of our audience members said, thank you to all of you for your courage to listen and lift women in leadership. And another person asked, what would you advise Rotary and Rotarians on being a leader in gender equity in all forms and aspects? What could be some goals? So I wonder if each one of you could formulate a goal that Rotary should take to heart as a way for Rotary to build a new world as peace builders, as Rotary to make pathways for equity. So one goal, Peter, you've been talking a lot, so I'm gonna ask Kate, Caitlin to go first. <laughs> Not that you, I've been asking you, Peter, to talk. So I'm gonna to move to, to Kate, who I didn't mean to exclude earlier, um, to, to offer one goal, and then I'll come to Amanda, and then to you, Peter. Mm. I think Rotary has a great um, space that it's already building from with its four-way test, which is really about asking questions about, um, it, uh, you know, it, are these things that we're doing leading to positive outcomes? And I think as a goal, um, part of kind of taking that that test further and, and kind of integrating it into everyday life and work is about um, also looking around and seeing who's in the room and how people are being valued and listened to. Um, 
we all have the power in our everyday lives just to um, kind of be this change to listen differently if we see someone uh, someone's ideas perhaps not being given um, full weight and a full platform to be explored. And um, so I do think Rotary is a great space for already modeling some of this. Mm-hmm. I think as well as I've spoken about earlier too, uh, there are a lot of other organizations that are local and they do a huge amount of peace building work, but they don't often get on the radar of big organizations, including Rotary. Um, and many of the women I Um, highlighted in my research are part of those networks and organizations and they're you know chronically underfunded they don't have enough partners to help them with this work and just um, reaching out to those sorts of organizations amplifying the messages uh, that they are and and the work that they're already doing is a huge um, is a huge benefit. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Rotary itself needs to reinvent the wheel. Some of this work is really taking place and Rotary has such an incredible power and network to lend it weight that would make a real difference. Thank you, Caitlin. Amanda, what would you offer as a goal for how Rotary could be part of this equity building version of peace building? Yes, um, I really like this question because it comes from this place of uh, how can we be part of this, right? And I, I love also what um, Kate said. I think the first step is recognizing this, like in this question, how we, um, how is it now? And the second is being intentional about changing it, like how we increase women's participation or how are the, the spaces we are in. And I, I know that Rotary, uh, Rotary International just uh, nominated um, a new president who is the first woman to hold that office in more than 100 years. So this is a tremendous accomplishment. So what I would say related to this question, it's like, how do we make that um, Jennifer Jones, right? Like how do we make uh, her not as an exception and how we make sure that her um, what she's proposing is being um, recognized and being amplified, not because she's a woman or despite of being a woman, because, but because she's a leader and she can um, do her job uh, without um, um, the influence of gender biases. So, and maybe she will be just the first of many other uh, women leaders to come in, um, in the Rotary's um, history. Let's hope. That's right. All right, Peter. So a goal that Rotary can embrace, an additional goal to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I was also going to say that it's it's amazing to see that Rotary elected the first female president in over 100 years. And that's that's something I would you know encourage, like creating more spaces for women in leadership. And as part of that is also um, just like Amanda's presentation on gender responsible, responsible leadership framework. We also need to give these strong, these women, these strong women, all the supports they need to excel in their positions. Um, I also, you know, I, I, I appreciate like our Rotary's um, sponsoring like the Rotary Peace Fellowship. And we have like more, we have women being like, we have platform for women um, in the fellowship. Um, I think there are also like many other initiatives that Rotary can be doing to empower women across the world to become leaders themselves. So um, I think the big picture is Rotary can do more. We all can raise platform for creating women leaders and every opportunities that Rotary can do, they should continue to do that. All right, well, Peter, thank you for for reminding me of uh, the way that we would like to finish out our round table. Uh, But before we get there, uh, there's just one other question that I see um, on this beautiful Google Doc that has been put together by the vaccines um, of our center. And and this actually goes to this question of understanding women leadership and whether there's a difference in kind uh, when women lead. Uh, and, And part of the difference in kind might be around whether we foreground individuals or whether we uh, make room for and actually center collectives. And as you think about leadership, I wonder if each one of you could speak, actually let's say this, um, let, I know that this is like the, the zone that Amanda and, and Caitlin talk about the most. So let me just ask the two of you um, how you think about collectives versus 
uh, individuals. And then Peter, you can speak a little bit about the collective that you've been a part of as well. So let's, let's start first with Kate. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, often collective and ind individual get pitted against each other, but in reality and in the work that I've been doing with women peace builders, um, it's actually much more nuanced and interwoven. So the work that say an individual who goes to brief the UN Security Council does to share that story is behind the scenes has been um, collectively put together. So it's in the kind of, um, as soon as, a, as, soon as a, a woman will find out that she's getting this opportunity, um, there, is, there are these processes that they've described to me of basically sitting together, working on the priorities together, letting things emerge. And they're not always easy processes. And I think anybody who's worked in collectives and tried to move ideas forward knows how fraught that is because we do all have our individual agendas and identities and priorities, but the idea is that um, it's in the working through that we get somewhere better. And the women human rights leaders who I work with in my own work, I've always recognized this, uh, that you know, we as individuals don't have the answers. So the working through uh, as individuals, as our ideas in collective spaces mean that um, we have a fuller understanding of the world and we're able to kind of bring, to, bring forward a vision which works for more people. So they're kind of always, I think there's always this, this working together of individual and collective. Yeah, thank you for that point of nuance and the ways in which they connect that individuals represent collectives often. I wonder if there's something brief that you might add, Amanda and Peter, before we go to our final segment. Yeah, I just want to say quickly, um, to add quickly that um, even in countries where women um, individually achieve the top position in the office, like presidents, today research shows that there's necessarily citizens still think that women shouldn't be in that position. So when we talk about collective, it's also like rewriting this uh, labyrinth, like I used on my presentation. Some women, they, individual women, they break the, the glass ceiling metaphor, but it's more of a labyrinth today. So um, with the collective action, a lot of women are thinking like how we get more women there. And as we re rewrite the pathway, it's not that hard for one woman, woman to, to achieve uh, to the top and then nobody else for, for years or she's by herself um, there and fending for, her, for herself in an environment where um, she is, um, there's gender bias and she's called aggressive, et cetera, et cetera, as we know. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, as somebody who's has helped create a collaborative and a collective. Can you say final words before we move? Yeah, I would just say, um, I will quote from a, a quote. I can't remember who said it, but somebody, somebody said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I, I, I believe if we want to correct structural inequality, such as gender inequality, we need to work together. Perfect, yeah. That's really nice. All right, guys and women actually, <laughs> women and men. Um, let's uh, close out this segment, uh, this final round table of our conference um, with you saying a little bit more about your next professional steps. So if, if the world gets changed one step at a time, one person at a time, going far together, Peter, um, can you just say more about how you will lead uh, in the way that you lead your life, how you will, uh, lead towards equity. And Peter may I ask you to begin. Okay, sure, great. Thank you so much. Well, I will continue to, to pursue social justice by creating platform for raising women leaders. I mean that I will continue to incorporate gender responsive leadership framework and the work that I do. Um, so in my next step, um, I'm looking for grants that will help me uh, build an interactive, interactive website that will look like a LinkedIn, that will be a platform dedicated for a community of women helping women. 
Um, as I said in my presentation, uh, we have a WhatsApp platform that has over 200 women. Um, we have these women interact and share resources, but that's, there is a limit to what you can do on WhatsApp. So we, we're thinking of like creating a big website that will be a platform for like mentorship, for support, for sharing resources and so on. And, and it's gonna be global. Um, and it's something that can be done every, anywhere. Um, secondly, for the next couple of years, I will be in the US for some personal reasons. So I'm really looking forward to inter international development opportunities in the US that will give me the opportunity of leading the design and implementation of programs for disadvantaged minorities subject to structural inequalities. Thank you all I for giving this opportunity. I know you will. All right, Amanda, how will you lead towards equity in your professional and personal life? Yes, um, I'm working on two parallel pathways. Uh, first, I'm currently working working on the design of a leadership development program for girls based on this gender responsive leadership model that I just presented today. It will be a web platform with 15 modules and tools to support girls, the younger generation of next leaders, to collaborate across differences in background, race, citizenship, and to create the changes they want to see in the world. This is a personal project and I will start applying for grants and funding over the summer to launch it, hopefully, this year. And the second pathway is that I'm also currently searching for a job in inter international organizations that support efforts for inclusive leadership and civic engagement to pay forward uh, this incredible opportunity provided by the Peace Fellowship. I want to use my background in communications and education to support more peace builders. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, Caitlin, how will you continue to lead towards equity in your professional and personal life? Well, I really plan to take the lessons of inclusion and meaningful participation forward in my PhD research, which is with women who are survivors of war and torture. And my work really thinks about psychosocial support in the aftermath of violence. There's currently huge gaps and it's kind of considered this black box in humanitarian aid. So I understand that in order to open that up, we need to um, understand the importance of centering uh, survivor stories and unpacking what's needed in that space. And also creating safe listening spaces if we're gonna to move towards more caring and equitable environments for care. And so those are some of the ways I really want to integrate what I've learned from doing this work as a Rotary Peace Fellow into creating those support solutions for women survivors of war. And I also think that doing this research this past summer with women from Yemen, South Sudan and Afghanistan has really reminded me and re-exposed again this depth of the problems of exclusion that still exist and how detrimental this is for peace building efforts. There's already so much work that exists on how to achieve meaningful inclusion. So the solutions are there and these changes are possible. They can be made but it requires political will and that's lacking. So I think governments like my own in Canada, we can really be stepping forward and stepping up to model these different expectations in peace and conflict decision-making spaces. And I plan to be part of those advocacy efforts to ensure these changes happen. And I really want to thank you for this fellowship. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of all uh, my cohort. Be because of this fellowship, I think we recognize that people have invested in us. And that gives us an extra reason to go out in the world and insist on peace building. Wow. Thank you all so much for what you have brought to the table and the ways in which you are reshaping the table. I, I actually thank the, the forces of Rotary, and there's so many, right, uh, for helping to give you force in your lives, right, to actually give you the analytical and the imaginative force that you have, but you have really taken it and run with it. Um, and I, I guess I'd like to end our, our roundtable here um, to, to say that, that Rotary is a part of listening to the Nobel laureate Ellen Johnson Sirleaf when she says, we are not only saying build better, we are saying this time, build differently. 
And I just want to commend Rotary as well for having understood that one way to build differently is to invest in these kind of peace builders. And I want to notice with everyone today how they have invested in building peace builders. So we have this beautiful example before us of the one pebble in the water that has very many ripples. And this is one of the layers that we see before us. So um, and let me congratulate all of you for all of what you've done and all of what you will still do. Thank you, Atbe. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you so much, everyone.